Welcome into K State Online. I am Mason Vote. That is Derek Young. Back after uh, a long weekend that did not involve K State playing basketball, it involved watching 68 other teams play basketball. But there was still some news on the K State front of things because the Wildcats have their first departures to the transfer portal this season. Cam Carter making his exit, and then Dorian Finister about a day later announces that he is leaving. Look, for K-State, the outside would look at it and probably say, oh, you're losing, you know, one of your top producers in Cam Carter. Like, what does this mean? I would not panic about K-State losing Cam Carter. Uh, Certainly there is value to, to Cam Carter's game, and there's no doubt ability and talent there. But K-State fans and anybody that watched them this year could tell you about the frustrations that are there with him. And it just didn't seem like K-State and Cam Carter wanted the same thing for each other or needed the same thing for each other to be the best that they could be moving forward. And that's ultimately uh, probably what led to Cam Carter making his exit from K-State after two years. Yeah, and to be honest, there was pro- there's probably a lot of fact or truth to the idea that he would have explored this regardless, just because I I do think that he's going to return closer to home. Um, and that's probably something that was in the back of his mind or something that he wanted to explore or consider doing uh, no matter what. And then you have to think that Kansas State has to do the best thing for themselves. And I think there's a scenario where they definitely wanted Cam Carter back at one point. And even – in the right role, they might take it now, but I don't know that role acceptance would be something attainable now that Cam Carter's had a taste of something a little bit more considerable. And, you know, I've said this on our three mile show, but you also have to take into account when well, you're almost like a NBA team and you're working with a salary cap and you need to allocate how much you want to invest in some players too. And, and marry that with what you still need from a a contribution standpoint. And, yeah, they can love Cam Carter, and they still love Cam Carter, but they also know that if they can't give Cam Carter what he wants, that's not good for anyone because that's not good for Cam Carter because you're uh, falling short of what you're giving him or what he wants. But it's also not fair to Kansas State because that will just – create problems down the road as well um, when you're trying to get him to accept a role that he never wanted to begin with. So the, the, it's kind of the Ish Masood situation from a year ago where you can love a guy, but understand that you both need to go your own ways. Well, and that's kind of what I was going to say. It's like, it, it's an upscale Ish Masood situation. You're basically going from like, uh, you're I, this, this may sound disparaging, but it's not meant to be. You're basically going especially because, you know, I'm, I'm down for this, but like you're going from a Fazoli's to an Olive Garden where it's like, <laughs> yeah, look, those, you know, you're you're upgrading a little bit, I guess, in some people's mind in terms of, you know, Ish Masood, not as good of a player as Cam Carter is, but there is still a level above that, which would be like the, the actual legit fine Italian dining that you could get. And I think that's one of those deals here where what you're talking about comparing it to the NBA is perfect because you can have that role guy that is the third or fourth best player on an NBA team. And you're like, we really want to keep them, but we got to keep these two stars because they're our best. It's essentially what the Mavs had to do with the Jalen Brunson situation where, you know, they had to ship him off and it's worked out for him. But you look around elsewhere in the league, you have guys that you could be the third or fourth best player on, you know, the, the Bucks, or you go be like the best or second best player on the Pistons. And they're going to pay you a lot more money than what the Bucks can because the Bucs have to play, pay Giannis and Damian Lillard and Chris Middleton and all these guys. So that's how NIL has to work here. And I think it's unfortunate for these staffs because there is still the element where they want to develop guys and they see what their possibility is. Like, I have no doubt that Jerome Tang and his staff view Cam Carter as a guy that they like and understand he can do good things for you on the basketball court. And they'd like another year with Cam Carter and see what he could do for you. But – it just wasn't going to work out for what he needed. And because like you said, with the Ish Masood situation, you're welcome back, but your role is not going to be what it was this year. If we want to be the best team that we can be. And what's best for K-State basketball is Cam Carter going back to being the fourth best player on this team. 
Yeah. And then, you know what? He he could go to, I you know, like, I think he's going to end up at LSU, maybe Florida. He's going to be in the SEC. He could go down there, score a lot of points, and, and be close he, to he home. He score a lot of points in the SEC right now. That's for sure. Yeah. He can go down there, score a lot of points, be close to home, be happy. So yeah. I, I think it, he, he's going to uh, be in a situation where he's happy, and I think Kansas State will be in a situation where they are happy. The other loss for K-State was Dorian Finister. This was another one that, honestly, in some ways, I was a little shocked that it didn't happen after last year because I just I never saw the role for Dorian Finister that uh, I think some of our KSO members saw out there. Uh, look, Dorian Finister probably provided more to K-State basketball this season than I would have ever anticipated. There was a legit stretch there where his presence on the floor was needed and welcomed because I do think at certain points early in conference play, there, there was some energy lacking, and he provided it. And while I don't think that he has the talent that some of the guys had on this team, I think K-State would have been better off if you would have been able to infuse Dorian Finister's understanding of how to hustle and work hard with some of the other guys because I think Dorian Finister did that, and that's why we saw some of those opportunities early on. But uh, what do you make of his departure, and, and does it mean anything in the grand scheme of things? Not a shock, and in the grand scheme of things, it probably doesn't mean a ton. It actually opens up a scholarship spot that you probably wanted because three open spots probably wasn't enough. You needed to get to that fourth. Uh, he helps his his departure helps in in that way, and I think him getting a taste of that action and then it being taken away from him when he became a non-factor the last half of the season and no longer got the minutes that he was grabbing in the first few weeks. I imagine that that diminished role um, and stripping of minutes and him getting a taste of it, he probably wants to keep that taste. And it, he saw the no light at the end of the tunnel, I imagine. So uh, I, he wants to play more. He wants a greater role. I can see Dorian Finister at a mid-major. Yeah, that, that seems like the the right kind of fit for him, and and an opportunity will be there. And we've seen other guys like that in the past from K State, whether it's uh, m most of it under the Bruce Weber, but he had guys that came in minor role, went somewhere else, and kind of found their their footing. Now, some of those uh, guys, I, I would think, you know, maybe you would have liked to have seen him stick around K State and have maybe somebody you know a little more offensive minded than Bruce coaching them. Yeah. It uh, wasn't because of a lesser rule, but obviously Selton Miguel left, and, and now mm -hmm. we've seen what he's doing at South Florida. Now, yeah. it took him a while to get there. Not a lot of not a and, lot of teams are going to have that patience, and he's probably closer to 30 than he is 20. Well, and Selton Miguel also, like, he, he got blessed with a coaching change that, I mean, South Florida, I know it's not as sexy yeah, as some, but like, there's a, a very high chance that uh, Abdul Rahim should probably be national coach of the year for what he did for for USF basketball. So, because uh, the jump they took, I mean, they they were making shots this year. That was when Selton Miguel initially transferred. I was like, that's a match made in heaven. South Florida was the worst three point shooting team in the country, and Selton Miguel didn't look like he could throw it in the ocean. And obviously, what he became was something different. So good for Selton Miguel and good for South Florida basketball. So. Uh, you, we've talked a little bit about, okay, this opens up some spots. K-State working with, at the moment, four open scholarships, uh, and then you're looking at possibly there could be more depending on what Arthur Kaluma's decision ends up being. I guess we start there. On the Kaluma decision, it seems like the momentum is swinging a little bit more towards, uh, not to be, the, again, this is like an, a Fazoli's the Olive Garden comparison. Uh, this is like probably Olive Garden to that fine dining. This is not Keontae Johnson, but something similar where there was some momentum towards the end there that like, it's not a foregone conclusion that he's going pro. He could come back next year. It seems like that's where things sit with Arthur Kaluma right now. I think the door is cracked for a return. Um, it might be best described as a coin flip. I do think that he will declare for the pros and give that, and explore, and explore that once again and probably to make his decision based on that feedback and, and how that process goes. But the door is more cracked for a return than I was anticipating. 
so if he leaves, that gives K State another scholarship to work with. But even if he doesn't, it seems like the Wildcats are in a spot right now where you have kind of the right number to work with, where you have enough that you can really upgrade the roster, but you're not going to have so many open that you're either going with empty scholarships or you're basically, you know, taking guys that are never going to see the floor for you. So what in your eyes is the ideal type of players that K-State should be targeting right now? Because there are still more guys that will have to enter and all this other stuff that will go down. But in terms of what K-State needs, what does that look like to you? Well, they have four spots left, even if Kaluma does return five, if he doesn't. And I think that's an ideal number to have. I really like, I think that's a good wheelhouse to be in um, because I don't think other teams, and we've seen what happens when other teams don't value roster continuity enough. If you just put together 10 to 12 paid mercenaries a year that are basically on a one-year contract. And if they don't do what you want them to do, you ship them out the next year and bring in 10 to 12 new ones over and over again, which seems to be the strategy of some, you're going to have quite a bit of volatility in your success or lack thereof from year to year. I think some great examples of that have been uh, what, what we just saw with Hubert Davis. He went to the national title, missed the NCAA tournament, now is probably on his way back to the Final Four. You can look at Arkansas. They went to like three out of four Elite Eights. This year wins like three conference games. Dennis Gates in Missouri last year. Um, they make the NCAA tournament. They build excitement in Columbia, Missouri for the first time in seemingly a decade when it comes to basketball, probably longer. And now they come back this year. They employ that strategy that I just referred to, and they can't win in a conference game at all. So you, you do have to value roster continuity. I appreciate that they are doing that. Um, and and I because I think that builds a locker room, that builds a team. And the now also, and this is something that's very apart from the floor, but I think it also helps keep a bond or connection, not just in the locker room, but I think there's one that's almost important because you want support, right? To between fan base, students, and team as well. If you just bring in 12 new guys, it's like you're you're basically forcing your fans to learn an entire new roster every year. They don't develop a connection to anyone, to any player. Like no one has a favorite player if they all are just gone after one only stick around for one year. So I think it's important for roster continuity in that respect right so i like i like the idea of that and i think just allocating four maybe five spots to scholar uh, to to transfers is enough but you you asked what kind they need to get some dudes like real dudes like i think you think you have probably two and i and i, and I realize some of them are one of the they're kind of limited in their own way they're they're role players in their own way but like data ames and david gasson can be fantastic basketball players for Kansas State next year. Um, so that that's something to keep in mind as well, that they already have some good players. But on the other end of that, something to keep in mind also is that when, when you're talking about this team and, and what they need, they're going to lose perhaps their top three scorers as well and Cam Carter and, Arthur, and potentially Arthur Kluma, Tyler Perry. So they need some guys that can really score – on the perimeter uh, more than anything. And, and that's why they're chasing a guy like Michigan transfer guard, Doug McDaniel. That's why they're chasing a guy like big man, uh, Amari Williams from Drexel um, that, you know, some of the best players in the transfer portal because they're losing a lot of production technically, but they also have guys that were a little bit further down in the rotation this year. That can be really, really good basketball players still. And that's important as well because Day Day Ames, man, he really came on in the last five to ten games of the season, and that can't be discounted. RJ Jones, assuming that he comes back, and I think he will, that's a guy that needs to become more efficient, but has the potential to be a really good shooter and scorer from the perimeter, right? Um, what are you going to be able to get from a guy like maybe Michaela Rich uh, later on? Jarrell Colbert, can he take that next step? You have some of these guys for, that you're keeping – for that roster continuity, um, look, for those that are just like, 
we're just bringing back a lot of the same guys. Those guys are going to get better. Um, that's what happens. And David Gasson and Day-Day Ames, even before you had three or four good transfers, that's a really good quarter to begin with. Yeah, I think y- you want to be able to to keep guys around for multiple years. And it's it's unfortunate that, like in the case of Marquise Noel, that's the kind of transfer that you would like where you have multiple years with him. And, it, I mean, the benefit to Marquise was that he was able to bridge the gap between the Bruce era to the Tang era, and he was a good kind of steward of taking things to, to Jerome Tang and like that. Uh, that was like a match made in heaven there, and, and you get lucky with that. But you want more guys where they're here for one year. Like Keontae Johnson was great, but you don't want to live off of that where it's, okay, we've got a mercenary bringing him in for one year. Like you can have a guy or two like that, but you, you're foundationally going to be better if you get a, a couple of multi-year transfers and then also build it through your – your freshman recruiting through the high school ranks. Like that is how Baylor got themselves to the position they were, where they won a national title, where we know that Scott Drew and his staff was really good when it came to hitting on transfers. But most of the way that they built it was they got guys in as, you know, college freshmen and developed them. And that's where they, they kind of built things. So I think K-State is trying to find that right balance. And I think it's important for people to realize that in year two, the shape of the program and the roster construction that Jerome Tang had to deal with when he came in, it was still going to be really tough to get that going. Now is when we have to kind of see this start to take more shape because the foundation's in place for the staff. They've been here long enough. So now you have to go out and execute this plan. And I think we're going to see that start to come to fruition through this transfer portal cycle. Yeah, there's a sweet spot to hit for sure. And I think that they've kind of hit it with only having four to five spots open for transfers. You mentioned you kind of hit on the paid mercenary thing or the one-year thing with like a Keontae Johnson. But I will say, like in their defense, and and they don't need me to defend them, like Keontae Johnson and Desi Sills for one-year players, they had no problem building that connection and bond with the fans. And I don't think it's just because they were good. I think they cared about it. Yeah, and that's you need that too. You need the, the you need the players to come in and have a reason to be engaged. And I think you know that this isn't like a shot, and we don't know for sure, but it just seems like body language wise, and the way that Jerome Tang talked about the team at certain points, you may have had some guys on this year's team that were not built that way. And you have to have the the mental and emotional side of the game to go with the physical side of the game that we know these players had. We saw a lot of guys that had the physical game to play at K-State, but to be successful, you have to have that other element, and that's what K-State is going to have to try and find uh, throughout the portal and, and everywhere else as we progress throughout this offseason that you know has a long ways to go now, but it's underway, and K-State will be in pursuit of some big-time targets. I, in a scale of 1 to 10, where is the pressure at in terms of, how K State needs to hit on on their portal success this year because I think they were fine last year, but obviously it wasn't enough. You didn't have the right pieces of the puzzle on this specific team. So where where does the pressure lie for you for this team? I mean, there. I mean, pressure. I get what you're. I guess I'm gonna like grapple a little bit with because like you pressure. have to. I think you have to make a team this year that plays in the NCAA tournament. Oh yeah, yeah, you definitely do. But I, I guess I wouldn't call it pressure. I just think they know that like they don't have enough firepower right now. So obviously they have to go into the portal and dig some firepower to be an NCAA tournament yeah. team. I, I would agree with that. Uh, I get. I guess I don't know if anyone looks at well, you know, like pressure. I feel like you like you feel like your backs are against the wall, and I don't know that I would describe it as that but I would describe it as, yes, you have to build an NCAA tournament team, and you can't do that without hitting on some big-time pieces in the transfer portal. Yep. We'll see how it plays out for the Wildcats. A lot of names out there, a lot more to come. If you want to stay in the know with it, head over to On3. Find us with K-State Online. And uh, if you're not a member, be one. You'll get in on uh, all the transfer portal talk. Also, plenty of spring football action coming your way. Uh, 2025 recruiting for football, right in the thick of things there as well. So, Lots to get to, and the best place to keep up with it all is over at K-State Online. We will be back on Tuesday. We'll get some thoughts from D.Y. on uh, the second open practice of spring football so everybody can know that Avery Johnson is still looking like 
one of the best quarterbacks in the Big 12 and whatever else comes out of that. Probably talk about the running backs a little bit because we didn't do that last week. So a lot to get to with K-State sports right now, despite the fact that games are over for men's and women's basketball, football still weighs off. Uh, but shout out to the K-State baseball team. The Batcats are hot right now. Nine straight wins. They just swept Houston over the weekend. Uh, they're off to a 5-1 and one start in Big 12 play, and they face Nebraska in the midweek. Uh, before they get a weekend series at home against Texas. So a lot going on with K-State right now, and uh, you can keep up with it all discussion-wise and whatever else over at K-State Online. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Both. Thanks for watching the KSO Show.